Hello, we're going to be using Responsive Prayer 1, page 282 in the Lutheran Service Book. Holy God, holy and most gracious Father, have mercy and hear us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, according <clears throat> he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he sits and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Don't you hate it when you keep mixing the apostles and Nicene Creed? Uh, on to the morning versicles. I cry to you, O Lord, in the morning my prayer comes before you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. For our cry and text for meditation, we are going to be using Psalm 119, session Chet, uh, which is going to be verses 57 to 64. So Psalm 119, beginning at verse 57. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your just and righteous decrees. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. Though the earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love, teach me your statutes. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So, looking into the grammar, or just, I guess, specifically more of the letter, uh, section Chet is using a letter we definitely do not have in English. <laughs> um, we do have an approximation in English, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but a Chet in Hebrew is uh, another H-type vowel. So we already had uh, a few sections earlier Section hey, this is verses 33 to 40 in Psalm 119. Uh, hey is the real H uh, corresponding with our H. So if we think ha or a, kind of going the, whether at the beginning of the word or the end of the word, well, yeah, that's basically how the Hebrew hey functions. Chet is a little bit different because chet is a harder H sound. Uh, in fact, this is what we would call a guttural H sound. Uh, H itself would be a little bit of a guttural in, in the Hebrew, but chet is far more of a guttural. Uh, chet is um, getting the action in the back of the throat there so that you would actually be in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we don't exactly have a correlation with this in English today, uh, but we do have an approximation of it with a hard CH sound, because this is basically where it came from. Uh, the hard ch sound as a k type of a sound doesn't come up in a ton of words and what i looked at looked this up um uh, the ones that are in common usage well we do have a number of them in common usage and this would be things like mechanical so you have the ch as a k type of sound 
psychology um, and also technology. Uh, you would have uh, quite a few words based on those, but uh, all those words bear a common link, which is they're based on Greek words. <laughs> and that would becoming far more obvious when we get to the ultimate k, or, you know, ch in English, k sound for uh, words that we use all the time in Christianity, which is itself Christianity, based on the word Christ. So Christ is coming from the Greek uh, Christus. Uh, Christus is, well, the anointed one, the Messiah, uh, the Christ. So Jesus Christ, or Christus, Christus is we refer to Christ in the Greek. So uh, that actually has a very specific type of sound, which is uh, what we call a chi. A chi is, um, for the Greek, more of a harder X. So with X, you it's actually more of a, or a xi is in, in the Greek. You have a K-S-I, so it's a xi, not a Z as we would typically have it like in xylophone in English, our, our X is a Z kind of sound, but in the Greek, it's a bit more of a K. So basically for the Greek, you take away the S there and just another K, and this is where we get words like Christ uh, and mechanical and technology and psychology. Um, for, for the Hebrew, the approximate sound for that is still more of an H sound, but they put such a on it, uh, the guttural back of the throat noise on it, that it is similar to what we would consider a, a, a K or a, the Greek chi. Sorry, not chi, uh, ki, chi. So not, not something that we typically use, but we do see uh, a little bit of a hint in it in English language, basically coming from a completely different language, Greek. <laughs> Okay, now on to the actual, the actual uh, uh, text itself. Verses 57 to 64. So Psalm 119 still going on through all the, uh, all the hope that we promise that we find in the law. Not that the, we are confusing law and gospel, but we recognize that the law is something good, something coming from God himself. Um, so much so... <laughs> Uh, the opening line here is really encapsulating all our hopes in God, whether or not uh, this is incredibly obvious for people using regular English phraseology. So uh, the first line, the Lord is my portion. That may not mean much to us today because we don't typically think this way in English, but it means a lot to a Hebrew speaker. And even uh, if you were talking to, say, uh, somebody who would also be speaking Greek in, in Jesus' day, this would still be something rather important. So what are we actually saying when we're saying the Lord is my portion? Well, a portion or part is a representative of what you would receive in an inheritance. The inheritance was basically the blessings God had given your parents now come down to you. So the blessings that God is giving to you, he is given through an inheritance. For the Hebrew people, this really meant the land of Israel and, and uh, family going on forever. Uh, so, with, so with the Hebrew people, this is something extremely important because this is how you enter into eternity in this world, is basically that all your hard work, all your property is going on to future generations and those future generations themselves, which is also your inheritance from God, they would be continuing these things on forever. So uh, all your life had meaning because it is brought out of the scope of just your life and brought into the scope of eternity, which is not necessarily how we phrase things in English. We don't necessarily call an inheritance a part or a portion, nor do we have um, a huge idea of what an inheritance actually allows. Or, or means beyond simply, oh, yay, we get some extra stuff to, to use in, in this world. Um, the inheritance for the Hebrews is basically your life. This is what your parents, your parents' parents, your parents' parents, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, basically. This is what they're giving to you so that you may actually have it, possess it, and uh, employ it 
uh, for not only yourself, but for everyone who's coming after you. So this is a connection um, with God in the scope of eternity. This is a connection with all your family members. This is also something in the scope of a little bit broader of the world. Um, although for most Israelites, they're going to conceive of the inheritance as being simply the land of Israel, because that's the inheritance they were given by God. But uh, even so, this is still has implications for the world because as you'll find in many prophecies talking about uh, the end times where you have the new heavens, new earth, uh, quite a few of the prophets, especially Isaiah, he, he's talking about this in a number of different prophecies, is that uh, once there's finally peace in land, Israel was just, is restored basically to Garden of Eden status. Uh, all the nations will look towards the land of Israel and all will flock towards Israel and bring their wealth into Israel so that Israel will be the, wealth, uh, the wealthiest of all in the new heavens, new earth. For us, this basically means that everybody's looking forward to the new Israel where God's heavenly city comes down from the heavens and actually opens up eternity there in front of us because this is where Jesus will dwell among us. So we're always uh, looking forward to Jesus Christ fulfilling us in terms of inheritance. So for us as Christians, how do we actually understand an inheritance? Well, we wouldn't necessarily tie this with uh, land so much, uh, nor would we necessarily tie this in with family, although these things are incredible blessings from God, that God does give us uh, everything that we need in this world, uh, when, especially when we pray for our daily bread. This is, this is what we're thinking of. Part of our daily bread is also our property or possessions, which we hope will actually continue on to future generations. And uh, beyond this, also our blessings would definitely be our families. So it's not like we're completely divorced from the concept of the inheritance being in that, but as Christians, we see the true inheritance being eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not necessarily uh, narrowing the focus to things of this world, like sometimes inheritance was narrowed in the in the mindscape of uh, ancient Israelites, where they're looking to the land of Israel and their families. Uh, but we're also bringing this out beyond that to the spiritual realm, to eternal life, the life to come. So for us as Christians, we're looking for eternal life. We're looking for the eternal possession of the heavens in the future, uh, the heavens on earth in the future as well. Uh, we're also looking forward to uh, the possession of Jesus Christ there in our midst. We're looking forward to a complete sinlessness of the flesh that we no longer will be bound to uh, a sinful flesh, original sin, will be completely freed and away from this. So inheritance is also, our inheritance as Christians is also forgiveness. Um, and basically every blessing that is promised in Christ, you can think of, yes, this is part of your inheritance. And when we have inheritance being articulated in the New Testament, and St. Paul does this quite a bit. Uh, he's talking about, well, life, sinlessness, heaven itself, but he's also talking about uh, being a child of God. Being a child of God actually means you get a share in the inheritance, and God's inheritance would actually be all of creation. So Paul would say this, all of creation does belong to Christians. So for us, when we're looking forward to the new heavens, new earth, we can also just tie this back to Again, land and family, uh, where we will inherit the whole earth, the whole earth uh, renewed, so better than what we see in this world suffering from sin. Uh, we'll see the world renewed. We'll also see animals in the world renewed, uh, that they'll no longer be afflicted by sin either, because animals are also affected by this. Uh, uh, if they weren't, then we wouldn't actually see, like, animals killing people. Uh, God actually forbids animals from killing people in Genesis chapter 9, so uh, animals are afflicted by sin, um, whether or not naturals would like to admit that. Um, so animals restored, the land, of, the land will be restored, and also in general just the creation will be uh, given to us. So when we're looking at the Lord is my portion, we're looking towards the whole of the heavenly inheritance that we're promised in God. And that's just the first line in this section of the psalm. Um, the psalm is saying the Lord is my portion is really looking forward to yeah, not only the inheritance in this world, looking forward to the blessings God gives us in this life, 
but the life to come. So God is also our inheritance. Uh, this is made manifest in Jesus Christ, who makes us co-inheritors with him, so that when Jesus inherits all things, Jesus, after his resurrection, says, um, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So when we look to Jesus Christ and become co-inheritors with him, we actually receive all things in this creation. And this is a beautiful gift from God. And this was, this was also what was promised to Adam and Eve way in the beginning, where God actually brought Adam and Eve into, into the creation so that they could have dominion over all things, the land, the animals, uh, everything in the creation. So uh, we will be stepping into that when we actually have the Lord as our portion, as our inheritance, because we receive him, we, we inherit him, so this is, this is everything given to us. Um, and to really hammer home the point, uh, when do you actually receive an inheritance? Well, this is received when somebody dies. Because if you go off and try to demand an inheritance uh, before somebody dies, basically you're saying, I wish you were dead. Uh, so if you think of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, uh, the prodigal son, when he goes to his father and says, I want my share of, of the inheritance, uh, the son is basically telling the father, I wish you were dead. And he's also trying to uh, rip away from his father what he needs to survive in this world. So this is not only, not only a... Um, a violation of the fifth commandment, wishing somebody was dead. Uh, it's also a violation of the fourth commandment, which is about honoring your father and your mother, so this son is not honoring his parents. Uh, this is also going into the seventh commandment, you shall not steal. So he's trying to get something that does not yet belong to him. Um, and you could also say that, yes, this, this came from coveting. So um, coveting your neighbor's house, that's basically what this is. So commandment number nine. Uh, so... In that one action, this guy, the prodigal son, commits very, very, very many sins. And we'll shortly find, like, in, the, in that narrative, he uses what he gains from that transaction to engage in a whole bunch more sins. So, <clears throat> uh, if, if we're inheriting God, well, does that mean that we wish God was dead? No, we're not wish, wishing God was dead. We actually want the living God. That's who he is. That's what we want him to be for us. We don't want a dead God, we want a living God, because if we're in God and we're, we have an inheritance, we want to be alive in him. So what we actually find when God makes manifest our inheritance, when he dies, we see him in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross dying. So it's not that uh, God himself is now gone and away from the universe, thus proving Nietzsche right that God is dead and we killed him. Um, what we actually see is Jesus Christ dying on the cross as he himself is fully God. So we see God dying upon the cross. And when he rises from the dead, we actually see him come into the fullness of the inheritance of the creation because he, because we see that God has died, yet Jesus Christ receives all of creation after the resurrection. Again, Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So Christ is the dutiful son. He's not the prodigal son who demands inheritance before, before the, uh, the timely demise of his father. Jesus is the one who inherits all things as the one who uh, receives these by, by a proper last will and testament, which is made manifest at the cross. So Jesus Christ died to receive all things, and when he rose up from the dead, he actually received all of this. So those of us who join with Christ in faith, join into his resurrection and have the promise of life, love, and everything else from God, yes, we have become co-inheritors and we actually receive all these things as an inheritance, uh, as children of the Heavenly Father. So you can see, <laughs> right at the beginning, verse 57, A, the Lord is my portion. This is, there's a lot to be said about this one little phrase. Uh, just because this brings together um, a lot of what it means to be saved in, in Christ. Um, it's not as emphasized as much anymore, just because it's not part of our culture, but uh, the theme of inheritance as an understanding of uh, salvation, because there's different metaphors for salvation in the scriptures. Uh, inheritance is one of them. 
th this is one of the main themes that we don't necessarily talk about as much. Okay, um, second half of that verse. I promise to keep your words. So we can actually see, like, the uh, Hebrew poetry, poetry comes in a bit of uh, parallelism. So if we say, the Lord is my portion, and the psalmist is saying, I promise to keep your words, reading this kind of in parallel, we're, say, we're seeing that I promise to keep your words is actually participating in the inheritance, participating in God, actually being um, uh, receiving the inheritance in our life now. Because if we're talking about blessings from God, do we receive blessings from God only uh, on the last day when we're resurrected from the grave? No, we're actually receiving blessings from God right now. Um, we, we can see all the worldly things. We can see food, drink, house, home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we can also see it, through Christ that, we're, that we are being given God's love. We are be, being given eternal life now. We are being given forgiveness. All the things that God promises to us is through Christ we are receiving right now. Uh, so if we're talking about the Lord as our portion, well, we're actively receiving the inheritance as we live in this world. And this is why we promise to keep God's words. We promise to keep the Lord's word because this is us actively being in God. God is actively giving us his inheritance. So if we are in the Lord, we're actively being in God and, and uh, using the inheritance for what he has called us to use it for, namely to serve our neighbor and serve him. Uh, Jesus Christ reduces the law of the Old Testament to uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And like what, and the second greatest commandment being uh, love your neighbor as yourself. So we're really talking about loving the Lord as the pinnacle of, of adhering to the word. Uh, loving the neighbor is also, uh, also something great, although not replacing God with the neighbor, and making sure that we have a good direction on this. But if we're also saying, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, we're also saying, well, there needs to be some sort of self-care, that we're not allowing ourselves to fall into sin uh, as we try to love the neighbor and try to love God, but we're actually taking care of ourselves too. We actually have some sort of um, uh, self-love, and the self-love can easily get out of hand, um, but you should understand, well, who are you in light of Christ and honor yourself that way. So loving yourself actually means loving yourself enough to follow God's work. More or less. Uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 58. The psalmist continues, I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. So here in... We're not talking necessarily about God's law specifically, because God's law specifically is more about uh, God's proper ordering, God's proper design, God's proper wisdom. And while we would want this to order our hearts, and our hearts do have God's word written upon them, Romans chapter 2, verses 15, uh, 14, 15. What we're asking here in the Psalm, verse 58, is that uh, we want our hearts disposed to receive God's grace. We want to be in the promises of God, because the promises of God are really the gospel. So it's not hard and fast law. The law basically tells us what must be done, what should be done, and how it is done. But if we're looking to the law, and well, we're going to eventually find that we have failed the law in some way, shape, or form. Um, and we want to conform ourselves to the law. We want to actually do these good things but we quickly find that we're not able to do this. So if we're receiving the promises, it is only by way of Jesus Christ who kept the law perfectly on our behalf. So we want to do these things. We want to, we want to be in all the promises of God, but we have to recognize that these things are promises. They're not laws. We're not entering into a contract with God, an inheritance contract with God saying, oh, well, I will... Uh, do X, Y, Z, and the Lord will give me uh, all creation. No, we're not saying that. that that's not what uh, this inheritance is all about. In fact, we find that we, since we violated um, God's law, that uh, if such a contract were to be made, and we can arguably say, yes, it is, because God had originally 
created Adam and Eve to receive all of creation. He, he said, and, uh, he told them that they had dominion over all things, be fruitful and multiply. So all the all the descendants of Adam and Eve, which means every last human being, uh, should have dominion over all things of this world. But since humanity fell into sin, we no longer uh, really have claim to to that original. Um, I don't want to say contract, but a, a original ordering of the law. What we actually find is that when you're brought up in Christ, when our, our sins are forgiven and we're placed back into the original dominion, or at least inheritors of the original dominion, when uh, all things are reordered and put back to the way they should be in, in the new heavens, new earth, um, uh, this is a gracious promise to God. It is not uh, based on our works, our will, but it's something that God does for us through Christ. So Christ is the one who has perfectly fulfilled the law on our behalf. We have not nothing to deserve this. And Christ is the one giving this to us as grace, something freely given, uh, a gift. Uh, verse 59. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. So this is getting on what I was trying to say with, uh, well, if we have God's law, then we should actually try to conform ourselves to God's law. So we recognize that our salvation, our inheritance, um, everything is tied through Jesus Christ our Lord, tied to the grace of God. But if we're also understanding ourselves as properly within God's creation, properly receiving the portion of God, properly trying to live out what God wanted us to live out in the Garden of Eden, we should actually direct our steps, direct our ways, make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do, because this is the good and proper ordering of the creation. If we were to do anything else, if we do anything less, then we would not be following God's, God's will, but we'd just be doing our will, our deficient will, our, our sinful will. We would always want to do what is good, what is proper, and even people who are actively doing wicked things, they're trying to do what is good and proper more so for them. And quite a few people are following um, misunderstandings of what is good and proper. And uh, to give you a really good example of that, LGBTQ issues. So people who are trying to champion LGBTQ issues and, and that position, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, or at least what they're normally trying to do is help their neighbors. They think that LGBTQ people are, are oppressed, so they're trying to make sure that this is front and center in people's minds so that uh, these people aren't oppressed or, or uh, discriminated. Now, is it actually right to do that? Well, according to God's word, well, LGBTQ philosophy is wrong and it's, it's sinful and we should not be engaging in these types of activities. So uh, the whole position is oriented incorrectly, but people are trying to do this, to fulfill this incorrect way, incorrect path, because they think that it's good. Uh, even people who are deliberately doing evil things and they know that they're doing evil things, uh, let's say committing a robbery or murder, um, they are doing these things for themselves. So they're doing it because they think they can receive some sort of benefit from it, uh, whatever it happens to be. So again, when you're, even when you're sinning, you're trying to do what is good in a sense, but they're not actually good because if you're doing something wrong, something sinful, then it is not of God. God is the very basic definition of what is good because God brought all things into being to make them very good at the very beginning, Genesis 1, uh, verse 31. So all things in the beginning were good. When they fall away from God, God's will, then that's when they become sinful. So if you're doing that which is against God's will, is by definition sin, not God. Um, so it, you always want to be doing good, and doing good would actually mean conforming to God's original plan for all things. Uh, the perfect creation at the very beginning. Verse 60. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. So for us who are 
now in the promises of God in Christ Jesus, who are now mindful of what we should be doing in Christ Jesus, which is namely fulfillment of the law that we were supposed to do way back at the beginning of creation, we hasten and do not delay to keep God's commandments. We really want to do them because this is just natural to us. God's commandments are written on the heart. And so this is the natural language that we have. Grace is actually the foreign one that we had to get used to, that we actually uh, ha can't perfectly fulfill God's commandments and we actually need help from God, uh, forgiveness from God, so that we may actually live in this world. But uh, yeah, we want to do these things because they are by definition good. So we want to go out and do them without any delay, without any, uh, with any hesitation. <clears throat> uh, verse 61. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. And as we go forth into this world to try and do God's word, uh, fulfill the commandments that he has set before us, we do find ourselves attracted by those who are uh, less than perfect, <laughs> i.e. sinful. So sinners do try to deviate our past, and this is a, kind of what I was saying a little bit earlier, so it's they don't have a perfect understanding of what is good, so they're either trying to promote something that is not good as good, or they're trying to do what is good only for themselves. So they're trying to exploit us, trying to uh, harm us deliberately, or they might try to assuage us over to a position which is against God's position. And this is more or less what we find ourselves in a relatively peaceful society, so a society that's not going towards war, like an actual uh, society gripped by the, thro by the throes of war. Uh, it would just be constantly trying to battle with uh, people seeking your own harm. But in a relatively peaceful society like we have in Canada, uh, the arguments are more uh, people trying to tempt us to other positions. So we're still in spiritual warfare, like we're in spiritual warfare in a war zone, we're also in spiritual warfare in peacetime. But the spiritual warfare in peacetime will be about trying to uh, remove ourselves from those who are wicked, their, their ideologies rather than their blatant attacks. And if we find ourselves being sucked into these things, because these people do believe that they're doing good work and they do believe that what they're doing is serving a good and noble cause, we might be, a, we might be sucked in by that kind of rhetoric that yes, they think that they're doing good, but if we believe that they're doing good, and then we'd be open to sinning the same way that they're sinning, and that misinterpreting what they believe to be good as good, instead of actually seeing it as against God's will. Again, I'll reference LGTBQ position, uh, because God has forbidden these types of activities, and, but uh, it's not that God wants to reject the people. God loves the people. God wants the people to be cared for. Uh, so in that sense, we're actually alongside uh, those who are championing the LGBTQ issues because we do want to care for these people and that's what they would use to ensnare us to um, uh, as verse 61 says in Psalm 119 because we actually do want to care for these people because God commands us to care for these people and God does love these people we do want to love them uh, but part of love actually means condemning certain activities, which actually would, that would be harmful to the soul. So we'd say, no, you shouldn't be doing this thing that is against God's will. But uh, people pro-LGTBQ issues would probably say, well, doing that makes them happy. So if you actually care for them, if you actually love them, you would uh, solidify them in this type of activity. No, <laughs> that would actually be harming them instead of doing them good. So they might be happy for a brief time, but they'd still be against God's word. So what you'd want to do is look to what God has actually promised, uh, what God has actually ordered. So you say, well, God has ordered the creation not to function in that specific way, so do not perform those actions. But all of you who are tempted will also look to God's promises, look to the inheritance that he has, look to our Lord Jesus Christ. If you, Even if you have committed sins, if you, even if you are tempted, all of this is forgiven in Christ so that you may actually receive something better in the world to come. Though in this world you may be afflicted and tempted towards something that is wrong, maybe even believing that it is good, Jesus Christ can forgive you your sins and bring you back on the path of eternal life, back on the way that God has ordered by his word, by his law, by his commandments. Uh, <clears throat> uh, verse 62. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your just and righteous decrees. Uh, 
So this is an expression of the piety of the psalmist. So if we're recognizing God's loveliness, his promises, his, his uh, great deeds for us, also his, the goodness of his law, the ordering of our days, then we would want to praise this at all times of the night, even at midnight, so where we just wake up in the middle of the night and then start praising God. So it's uh, kind of a little bit of a hyperbolic statement trying to emphasize that, well, even at this very awkward time, we would still want to praise God. We'd still want to do what is necessary to uh, live in God's just and righteous decrees. And this is loving the Lord with all your heart, with mind, soul, and strength. That, that would just be what it is. So for us as Christians, that might mean that we want to uh, do this at midnight. It could also mean that we could do it at any time of the day, uh, even, even the ones that are inconvenient, uh, even the ones that might actually bring people against us. If, if we're praising God for giving us the just and righteous decree, do not commit homosexual acts, as God outlines in several passages in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, uh, then that might draw a lot of flack from people in this world, but we still want to praise God even in that uh, dire situation. Uh, verse 63. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. Yeah. <laughs> even though the wicked in this world, those who are following after their own sins, their own desires, uh, even though they may be against us, may lay traps for us, uh, as the psalmist says, um, or if we're looking to some of the other psalms, they may even just outright attack us in various ways. We are still the companions of all those in the church. So if God has given us fulfillments of the gospel in our Lord Jesus Christ, all we need to do is look to Christ and see the whole Christian church on earth and in heaven united in his body. So if we're talking about the body of all believers, uh, we're talking about the body of Christ and we can look at the body of Christ and know that, yes, we are connected to all believers. All of us are connected together in faith through Christ. So if we are looking to um, our neighbor, we have to look at them through Christ, knowing that we are in the church, that we hold fellowship with all those who are, are in the faith. We, we know that we are not alone, even if we are opposed to the entire world. So we are companions with all those who fear him. Now, what this gets tricky when we recognize that some people may actually be enticed by the ways of the world, or maybe even their own uh, misguided precepts of what's going on in Scripture. So, yes, we'll find some divisions in this world uh, within the church. So, I'm preaching as a Lutheran pastor. I'm not in fellowship with uh, anybody who's not Lutheran. So, that's a pre pretty clear division between me and the rest of the church. Uh, would I say that they're all condemned? No, I would never say that they're all condemned because if you're united in Christ by faith, then how can I condemn you? God has forgiven you all your sins, so I can't condemn you of any sin. Uh, I can just uh, by by I can't condemn you of any sin that would remove you from Christ. <laughs> uh, I I can though uh, make judgments, proclaim judgments, saying that such and such actions are wrong, and you should be seeking forgiveness for such and such, and this would actually. Be related to doctrine. So if a, if a Christian church was not having proper doctrine, I could say, well, this is wrong. You should actually be doing it this way. And even though I'm not saying that they're barred from Christ, I would be saying that they have done something wrong and are uh, in need to reverse things so that they can be in proper ordered design that God has, has uh, called his church to be in. So I'm a companion of them, but I'm a companion of them insofar as is I am united to them in faith and need to love them by guiding them according to God's law and God's promises. Verse 64. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. So, To cap off this section, uh, the psalmist is, again, bringing this back to creation. So uh, I kind of wormed, its, wormed creation into the Lord is my portion because the Lord has created all things, so all things the Lord has created uh, are, are also our inheritance. Uh, but if we're just looking out at the inheritance, the earth, uh, that which God has brought into being to be very good, even though it's tainted by sin at the moment, uh, the earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. 
because the world still exists. <laughs> God has brought the creation forth to actually be good. So if we're looking to the creation, we're going to be seeing God work through it, giving us his love through it. This is our daily bread. This is him giving us what we need to live. So we recognize God loves us by giving us people and things in our lives that will actually sustain us and bring us forth into life, uh, life in the flesh. We'll also see God loving us through more supernatural means, that is, uh, loving us according to the gospel, proclaim, proclamation of the law, uh, giving of the word, giving of the sacraments for our spiritual good. So not only do we have things that sustain the body in this world, we have things that sustain the soul because God is acting through things in this world to sustain our souls. So God is acting through the church. God is acting through where he has his word proclaimed, where the sacraments are given. Um, the church is basically defined by God's word, God's sacraments, because that is where God is recognized by faith. So if we're all united to everybody in faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in the Christian church, then we're going to where faith is present, namely where the word and sacraments are given. <laughs> if they're not given, if they're withheld, then, they're, then these people are doing what God has not asked us to do, but in fact, sinning against God by withholding uh, the love and grace God provides to people through word and sacrament ministry. So if we're looking to the entirety of the earth, we're going to be seeing God act towards us through natural means, through supernatural means, and give us what we need to live forever. And in recognition of this, we say, O Lord, looking to the earth, ordered by God's, by God's word, uh, ordered according to his law, we, we ask him, teach me your statutes. Uh, the final line of, the psalm, of this section of the psalm. Uh, so we want God to teach us his statutes so that now that we are in the promises of God, now that we recognize that we are in the promises of God, that we are in the inheritance of our Lord, what do we want to do? Of course we want to do exactly what God wants us to do, the one who has given us all things. We want to follow his will, which means doing the law. Amen. So uh, we will conclude with prayer, uh, with, with the morning prayer, page 283, and we'll also be praying Psalm 119, verses 57 to uh, 64, section Chet. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with my whole heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your just and righteous decrees. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. <laughs>